Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, an inside look at the newly updated ICS 515 course. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute, and I'll be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Robert M. Lee, SANS instructor and course author. If during the webcast you have any questions for Robert, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Robert. Thank you so much and thanks everybody for joining me today. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, get to share with you some of the details of the newly updated SANS ICS 515 course, which is really about active defense and incident response or taking an active approach like hunting in your environment and being able to respond to what you find. Um, I built this course a couple years ago now, and it's been through a number of iterations, but but I like to consider this the first major sort of facelift of, of the class. We've uh, always been good about keeping it up to date with the latest and greatest, but but we've done a whole lot of changes, especially with the course lab scenario. Um, and and really, this is just reflective of, of the growing knowledge set in the community. We've had a lot of ICS 515 alumni sort of come back and share their best practices and go out and use what they learned in the field. and. And, and that sort of growing community has been outstanding. I mean, when this course was built, and I think actually still today, there, there's no other ICS sort of hunting and incident response course out there. Um, so this is definitely where we've been seeing a lot of that knowledge grow and a lot of those changes in the community. I, uh, I often tell folks that I wish I had this course when I started my career. Um, I started it um, years ago in the US intelligence community and I built um, a first of its kind mission looking at the nation states breaking into industrial. And it's it's not just about how do we identify and respond to nation states, it, it's about how do we find and respond to threats, which are the human threat, the, the other side of the keyboard. I'm sure they might use malware, they might use capabilities, and we go through all of them in the course, but really it's about making sure that we know how to find and do investigations in our environment against adverse activity. Um, again, not only is nation state, but always, always that human threat, because that's the things that we're concerned with most. So let's jump into it. First and foremost, you know, these are the ICS 515 objectives. This part hasn't changed. Actually, the structure of the class in terms of the days and what we hope people get out of it hasn't changed. That that has always sort of hit the nail on the head from the beginning. You know, really looking at making sure that students are are prepared to look at their networks and and prepared to respond to what they find. We find a lot of times that uh, folks that come through the class that go back to the organizations and start taking a look in those industrial networks, they end up finding things and you need to be ready with either an investigation or incident response procedures for what you're bound to find. Um, but also we need to have an encouraged uh, sort of nuanced discussion on everything that we approach. Um, there are a lot more threats out there than people realize and there are a lot more aggressive actions going on than we've ever seen before but we need to avoid the alarmism and hype. I usually tell people that the threats are far worse than they realize, but not as bad as they want to imagine. Um, the power grid is not going to fall down because a phishing email occurred. Um, but yes, we do need to figure out how to protect our plants, like uh, identifying VPNs between manufacturing sites to uh, go in and take a look at it and realize that there's probably already activity down there and we need to take an approach on dealing with it. Um, but also dispel some of the misconceptions and hype of the adversary by really looking and learning from the threats. Uh, I, I hear myths all the time about how awesome the adversary is or how they have to get only one thing right and defenders, you know, they're, they're oh, woe is us, uh, adversaries have the upper hand and, and all that's just trash. And we have to address it as such and figure out exactly why defenders are in a great position um, to take this challenge on and to treat it seriously and, and be able to have defense and reliability and safety in their environments tied to security. Uh, but ultimately what that means is let's figure out how to use the right concepts for the right challenges. We want to learn from the threats to make sure we prioritize real risk instead of just trying to play whack-a-mole with security. So as I said, the outline of the, the class has remained the same, but I'm going to get into the days um, and what they've changed and then also show you sort of our new course scenario. Um, the first day 
we get into sort of understanding what the value of threat intelligence is and where you can consume it and pushing past just this idea of threat feeds and IOCs, but more into actually consuming a knowledge of adversary tradecraft and how we prioritize those things, how we make a, how we really understand and use a threat model, how we pivot from uh, adversary tradecraft into hunting into the environment. And that's when we kick off on a day two and do an understanding of industrial protocols, industrial communications and assets and how to um, identify things in the environment and how to do network security monitoring and really try to find uh, activity and threats in our environment. Day three, of course, we get into the instant response. How do you prepare that team and structure it? How do you figure out how to go past the tabletops and really get into what you are going to do during the IR, especially in industrial environments, and what type of data sets are available to you and how you can use them. And day four, we get into threat environment manipulation, which is really kind of the, um, there's a lot of malware analysis focused to it, but the threat's not the malware, it's the human, so it's not always malware based. But, but we really get into the, how do you learn from the threats and map that back to making changes in your environments? If we just go through instant response, if we just go through these procedures and not really learn and, and make changes, then we're not gonna really facilitate change in our environment in a meaningful way. And then day five is still uh, a scenario where students go through two different industrial environments and respond and identify the two different types and sort of classes of threats. Uh, and, and that's a big challenge day with uh, challenge coins on the line for the winners. So outside of the days not changing, a number of the, the labs and the structure inside the days have changed. Now, one thing that I'll point out is I always like to start the days in this course with a case study, but I don't wanna just brief on, and here's Stuxnet, because obviously you would hope that you've heard about Stuxnet sometime in the last eight years, right? But, but it's much more about what are the technical components that you could have identified and detected in the environment? How would we have done that instant response? What do we need to know from that case study from a technical perspective to inform our defenses going forward? And we, we do that each day, take a different uh, piece of malware. Um, there's now been five pieces of uh, sort of families of ICS tailored malware. We take a look at each one of those in depth. Um, as well as some of the campaigns that have been launched against our industrial sectors. But then we go through and build out our, our control system. You'll, you'll have a, uh, still have a Sabati uh, control system kit in class that everybody gets to build and keep after the course um, and sort of set that up. But then we get into trying to figure out how to think critically and think a little bit different. The day one is really focused on exploring the uh, sort of analysis skills that are going to be required much more so than just ingesting indicators. Um, but we do get down into actually doing some cool labs with mapping out industrial infrastructure through things like Shodan, but importing it into tools like Maltigo and really trying to understand how you're going to visualize your attack space. Um, day two is when we really get into the core scenario. And what happens is you'll have a, a complex lab scenario, and I'll, I'll, I'll brief that again towards the end of the presentation. But you're going to go and map out the environment. You're going to try to visualize and make a network topology of all the industrial equipment and things that are in that environment. Then you're going to be collecting data sets off of it and looking for malicious activity. We're going to find some stuff. You're going to try to figure out what that abnormality and what those things are, what, what's going on in those environments. Um, but you're also then going to kick off instant response because, spoiler alert, you're going to find something. So we'll continue that scenario into the next day when we'll have an overview of what we want to be able to do, but each one of the labs are tied directly to the scenario. So we'll teach about evidence acquisition, but you'll jump right back in the scenario to do it. We'll teach about forensic data and ICS networking and jump right back in and do it. And we keep going through where the entire structure of day two, three, and four are one large scenario that you're working through on each lab. And you're taking different components of it on each day. Um, by the time we get to day four, we're trying to figure out exactly, well, we should have a pretty good understanding of exactly what happened. And you're gonna analyze exactly how it got into the environment, do the timely malware analysis, and then develop out some ER rules to help pass to your responders to use in the future. Um, but day four also takes this really deep uh, sort of threat analysis day again, looking not just at ICS tailored malware like the Black Energy 2 case study, but really looking deep into the Ukraine power grid attack in 2015, power grid attack in 2016 and into uh, the Trisis malware um, that happened in the uh, Middle East of 2017. Um, that These pieces, these cases are so important um, for a couple of reasons. One, the 2015 attack in Ukraine was the first time a cyber attack ever took down a portion of operations in a power grid. So that's, that's important. 
Um, crash override is the second time it ever occurred, but now we're seeing knowledge codified into scalable malware. So we're seeing a sort of an upperizationalizing sort of a case with this. And then down into traces, it's so important because this is the first time a piece of malware specifically targeted human life. Um, luckily, it failed in its attempt to do so, but targeting the safety instrumented systems, the only reason those exist is to protect human life. Targeting those systems in the way that this was done in, in, in uh, the location that it was done, the victim site, uh, either the adversaries intended to kill people or they just accepted it as a reality. Either way, um, that is awful and, 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 and egregious in many ways. And we need to learn about the tradecraft there and what was going on to protect not only our systems, but our, our people. Um, so that's that's the outlines, but here's some of the, the thoughts that I have in terms of how we've updated the course and, and really some of the things that I want people to be able to take away as well before we get into this the course scenario. Um, the first of which is specifically understanding and addressing your threat landscape. I think a lot of times we hear about the threat landscape or threat modeling. A lot of organizations just take IT security best practices and copy and paste them in, or they listen to the larger industry, but don't necessarily understand theirs specifically. So throughout the class, in going through all of these different scenarios and going through all these different case studies, we also talk through how to figure out exactly what your threat landscape is and learn from your intrusions and what's going on in your environment to make sure you prioritize controls off of your specific threats. Um, we have to get out of this, let's just architect it well and patch it mentality. Um, uh, we have a, there's a report coming out later this month um, specifically on like the vulnerabilities um, so this month being February, by the way, for those watching the webcast in the future. Um, but the the vulnerabilities piece, you know, there's 63% of the uh, vulnerabilities that came out in the ICS community last year. So 63% uh, of the vulnerabilities that came out actually didn't really reduce the risk at all when you use them. Um, it didn't actually address the underlining risk because of the insecure by design um, systems and protocols and also just some limitations in the ways that those vulnerabilities can be used. So if we have this mindset of we're just going to architect it well and patch it, we're never really going to do defense. Um, but if we take that active approach of going through and monitoring and learning from and hunting for the adversaries and apply that in from our environment directly to what we're trying to do and prioritize for ourselves, we can actually get down to a really good view of, of what we're doing, how we're measuring it, what the value of security is to the organization, and, and make that justification while also delivering defense. You know, and that also comes down to threat coverage in terms of how we're prioritizing our detections and how we're prioritizing our hunting efforts and response efforts. Um, regardless of organizations, whether it's industrial or IT, if I walk into an organization, I ask to see their signatures, their rules, their endpoint protection system sort of heuristics, ask to look at their coverage of their threats. Almost all companies significantly prioritize, and I would say on the upper ends of 70% or more of all of their detections are prioritized on command and control. Why? Because that's typically the easiest thing to detect, and we want to make sure we at least detect the adversary, you know, beaconing back out of our environment so they're their infrastructure and exfiltrating things off our environments. But that means if the adversary does something really cool or novel or unique or something that we don't detect in C2, that we don't actually have the coverage along the other phases to even figure out what else is going on. So we have to understand from our environment and from our threat landscape what the coverage should look like and then tailor our defenses and detections and ways we approach the problem to actually give us that coverage. Um, that also goes back to the that sort of myth in the community around, well, the adversary has to do only one thing right and defenders have to detect everything. And that's simply not true. Actually, when you have good kill chain coverage, the, the reality is the adversary has to do everything right to not get detected. And you only have to detect one phase of what they're doing and pivot from there to an investigation to figure out everything else. This is also why the idea of, well, what if it's novel tradecraft and unknown malware and zero day uh, exploits? That's also where that sort of falls to the side as well, because at any one phase, absolutely, something can be truly novel and undetectable, um, but you're not going to get that across every phase. The adversary is going to do something in the same way that they've done it before, or even other adversaries have done before. I mean, phishing as a uh, tradecraft is pretty common. Um, it's definitely detectable. We could extend our kill chain coverage with an understanding of our threat landscape. And again, put that human component on, on detecting and monitoring hunting correctly. This is what we start getting to when it comes to defense. 
I mean, the course as well, we added a bunch of understanding of the different activity groups or basically the, the human groups that have been targeting um, various industrial sectors. There's a bunch we've put into the class, even past this slide, of here's the threats that are actually targeting not just infrastructure companies, because there's a lot of those, but targeting the industrial control side of the house, the, the manufacturing, the automation networks, um, the operations technology equipment. Uh, which groups have specifically been targeting those? What have they been doing? Let's learn from their tradecraft and apply that tradecraft mentality into how we hunt and investigate and respond in our industrial environments. Um, past that, we also added uh, quite a bit more on the protocols and communications you'll see in industrial networks. Um, there are a lot of protocols out there, but there are a few major ones in every given industry that we can cover in depth. We're not going to cover all 250 plus ICS protocols and all of their then variations. Um, when people say like, oh, we, we understand Profinet. Well, there's like 53 common versions of Profinet. Um, so there's a lot of iterations there underneath. And we're not obviously going to do all of those. But there's a lot of major ones like Profinet and Ethernet IP and, and DMP3 and ICCP and IEC 104 and a bunch of major industrial protocols that you need to be familiar with and understand how to identify them and adapt appropriately. So we, again, we go through that in the class as well and added some more material on that. Um, and of course, we keep injecting in a bunch of case studies on like, how would you actually do data collection in a gas distribution location? Um, pivoting from there, how would you actually do instant response in an electric control center um, uh, environments? So we just go through a number of tangible scenarios to prepare you, as well as the knowledge around that to make you effective. Um, but everything really ties back again to that core scenario of being extremely hands-on. This course is a very, very hands-on course. I would say that there's uh, 20, 20 something plus labs, but you're spending at least half of your day every day in labs, but you're reinforcing the knowledge that you learned. So let's go through in the last portions of this webcast, the, the big changes. And this is where the majority of the change of the course has been, which has been updating the course scenario. So previously, the entire course scenario was working through an investigation in a traffic, uh, traffic light network. I've not removed that from the course because I still think it's extremely valuable, but what I've done is I've made a lot of that be in the slides as examples uh, and trying to show people how to work through an investigation as well leading into the labs where you're going to be doing it now in a different scenario. So the scenario uh, is much more complex and actually you may not be dealing with just one attack. So it's it's uh, I. I think that this is going to be a, a daunting challenge, but an extremely fun one. So I've tried to make it as fun and lighthearted as possible. So the way I know how to do that is comics. <laughs> so we put some skate of me and little Bobby stuff in here as well in terms of the scenario to make sure that it's still a little lighthearted, even though it is going to be intense um, because the the old lab scenario was like four different controllers and and an HMI. Uh, we're, we're like triple that into what you're doing now um, on a very complex network. Uh, specifically for water. So what we're doing is we've got the city of uh, Calistoga in Sansistan. So uh, this city, we're trying to protect what they're doing, but they've got electric power, water plants, gas pipelines, you know, the large, robust infrastructure sites. But specifically, we're dealing with Calistoga Water Utility or CWU. And in the scenario, what this is, is a water utility that is providing services to the city aquarium. What it, in reality it is, um, is I built a uh, industrial lab, actually had some, some help actually putting some equipment together from Tom and Norman um, and making sure that this was uh, a reflective of a water utility, but put a bunch of industrial equipment with various sealed ethernet converters and, and control systems and a variety of different protocols, actually probably more ICS protocols than you'd actually need in this environment, but to give a lot of diversity to the scenario uh, and had all of this equipment, and I built a 70 gallon uh, aquarium, uh, put some fish in there because you need to protect life, right? We're industrial. Uh, and had the control systems actually operating water levels, pump levels, uh, and uh, trying to deal with a lot of other things in this environment that you're, you're gonna be exposed to. And really the whole point of the scenario is, is revolved around these residents of this aquarium where uh, the city aquarium really cares about things like mean time to recovery or MTTR and root cause analysis. And we want to make sure that, that the fish's lives aren't endangered. Why? Because of course, adversary nations 
are trying to break in and have a competitive advantage in their aquariums because right now during our scenario there is a global uh, sort of aquarium competition going on for the city aquarium is to highlight the best city and the best country uh, in the world for beautiful exotic aquariums so a little bit silly but the whole point of course is we've got uh, various complex adversaries trying to compromise CWU and potentially kill the fish. Uh, we, of course, are wanting to protect the fish, and you are going to get exposed to that entire scenario, uh, walk through from the initial notification that something's weird all the way down to investigating it, working through it, responding to the attacks, um, potentially identifying other intrusions that are ongoing as well and figuring out how to handle those in the middle of an instant response because the world is never so straightforward as only having to deal with one thing. Um, mapping out all the various industrial protocols and figuring out what's going on, making the ER rules to pass to our partners over the traffic lights company because um, the city is still running the traffic lights uh, networks as well. Like I said, you'll still be dealing with those and getting to build these nice little Sabati kits with the Raspberry Pi and, and take them home with you after class for continual education. Um, but you're you're going to be dealing with with quite a bit. Um, so if you think about it, the old class, I don't say the old class, but the, the previous version of the class had one scenario tied to this, which was extremely fun and, and useful. And that now is just a subcomponent of like multiple different scenarios that are running and unfolding. So uh, the class has sort of kicked it up a notch. I, I already thought it was in a good position, but I think the community's grown enough that uh, I, I don't feel bad about making it even more sort of difficult, but it's, it's all still extremely um, uh, manageable. And for the folks that have never done a lot of this before, don't worry, every single lab in the course has literally click by click, button by button, um, step by step kind of walkthroughs. So even if you're new to this field in general, coming to the class, you're you're going to be well prepared and you're going to be able to work through it, no problem at all. Um, and then for those of you that don't want to use the walkthroughs, you can, and, and you can just work through, a, again, a very complex scenario, I think, that's put forth. So the, the scenario flows or the classroom discussion or the slides will center around that traffic lights and they'll be experiencing their own unique attack. Um, and then the core scenario in terms of the labs will center around mostly the water utility and a unique attack or two that you're dealing with there as well. And you actually have questions and challenges throughout the course that you've got to answer and we'll answer sort of as a team. Um, and the core scenario goals across the entirety of, of the course, actually across the four days, um, not not on the fifth day, which is the challenge day, is in the water plant, we have to satisfy certain goals like making a topology of the network, but we've also got to figure out the root cause analysis of the attack, what the intrusion and infection vectors were that led to the attack, and if there are other intrusions and are, are they related to the attack. In the traffic light network, very similar, we're trying to figure out are there other intrusions and what's the root cause analysis, and in general, we're trying to figure out um, if there's activity groups out in the wild that have been related to uh, what's going on here in these environments and if we can share some lessons learned and indicators uh, or maybe even potentially tradecraft with our fellow utilities. Um, at the end of this scenario, you'll have gone through uh, quite a bit. Again, I, I, it, I will say, not trying to spoil the scenario, there are far more than just the initial one or two intrusions that you might think there are. And you're going to be working through and figuring out how to keep these things apart while also responding. It is, uh, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. I've I obviously had to work through it after making it, and even as someone who I, I consider myself fairly experienced with instant response and intrusion analysis, um, man, it, it was fun. So I'm really looking forward to exposing uh, the students to this. Uh, so in general, course has been updated with new content, um, but a lot of the content was was still perfectly fine. It just some of it we've learned new things over the years, and we want to make sure we represented that. But the main content changes. And the slides are for new threat groups and activity groups and what's been going on there. The biggest changes to the course is, is in the entirely new scenario and labs and much more complex environment. Um, just finishing out the webcast, I'll also highlight, of course, we also have the grid. Uh, so the, the Global Response and Industrial Defense Certification, um, that's accompanied with this course. When you sign up for the course, you can also sign up for the grid um, certification and take that. We've had a lot of great response from folks doing the cert and actually um, giving us a lot of good feedback on how much they enjoy it. So I'm, I'm excited to start seeing some of these skill sets get codified into a sort of industry known certification that we can extend our knowledge here as a community and, and take it out and, and 
really make sure that we make it hard for the adversaries. Um, and then as I boil down down to the uh, Q&A session, we've got five minutes for Q&A, and this was intended to be about a 30 minute webcast. Um, also a note for everybody, there is the ICS community forum. I've seen a couple thousand people now join that and be able to share lessons learned and thoughts both before and after the class. Uh, so feel free to join that as well. So with this last couple of minutes, I'm gonna pull over and see if there's any questions. Um, we've already got a couple. Feel free to ask anything that you want as well while I'm answering these. So uh, the first one is I'm scheduled to attend the class in Orlando with a course software work with a Windows 10 system or do I need a Windows 7 box? Um, everything works on Windows 10. So uh, we actually expect everybody to come with a newly updated sort of Windows 10 operating system. Um, you can bring a Mac or a Linux system or whatever you'd like as long as you can run a VM that has Windows on it because a number of our tools for the instant response day are, are Windows based. I mean, there's um, tools that aren't, we'll get into some Linux tools in those, we have VMs for those, so that's not a concern. But you'll need to bring either a operating system that is Windows 10 or a um, a, a VM that, that has it in it uh, with you. It, it, technically, you could probably still use Windows 7 and 8, but I've troubleshooted all the labs and things and, and have an FAQ basically for anything that comes up on Windows 10. I, I will not be well positioned to tell you if something breaks on Windows 7, what it is exactly, but we can work through it. Um, specifically asked about on-demand offering. Yep, absolutely. So the uh, the course is getting recorded at, uh, so this course, this new updated course launches at the SANS ICS Summit. Um, which is in March in uh, uh, Orlando Studios, or no, excuse me, not Orlando Studios, at Walt Disney World. Uh, and when the course launches at Walt Disney World, they will record all of the on-demand uh, materials there, and that will have the on-demand course updated to that. Uh, that usually takes them about a month, so I'd expect the um, on-demand updates for this course to probably come around April, if, if I'm a, a betting person. Um, obviously, I can't commit to anything because I, I don't I don't work in the on-demand group, but they're usually pretty quick on that, on, on recording it at the summit and then updating pretty quickly thereafter. Um, question about the certification. So the most of the content in terms of content that would be on the certification um, hasn't changed, right? So the the content for the certification matches. Let me let me back up for a second and say the the certification covers content in the previous version of the course but nothing has been taken out of the course in terms of that content. There's just new content that's been added. Um, GIAC though has the new course material and they are going through it now to update the certification anyways. So the certification will be updated as soon as the class is updated, basically at the same time, so that March summit. Um, but it, regardless of when you take it, if you took an older version of the class, it's probably gonna be easier for you for a while because the new material won't be on the cert immediately, which means you'll have less material to cover. That, but eventually when the course launches in March, before the cert is updated, you, you'll you have more material, but it all won't necessarily be on the cert. Um, but as I say that out loud, it doesn't make sense because the certification will be updated exactly with March. So yeah, if you're, if you're taking the certification now, it doesn't apply. If you're taking the certification after March, it'll be based on the new version of the course. Um, but it's all the same material. Uh, basically, the big changes are the, the lab scenario, which aren't aren't the portion of the test that's that's really focused on. Um, is this going to be available in the Asia Pacific region? Absolutely. Um, so the course runs all around the world. Um, basically, we just prioritize based on interest in the community. Usually, what happens is we'll take SANS ICS 410 out to different regions, and then when there's uh, sort of a cadre of alumni of ICS 410 built up places, we'll bring 515 thereafter. Um, I expect expect uh, this course this year not to run. I don't, I don't, it might run in Singapore. I, I'll have to, it's really up to the Asia PAC sort of uh, SANS community. Uh, but I, I think it might be doing something in Singapore, but I, I also think that there's one in New Zealand potentially later this year as well. Um, I'll have to, I would just say, go to the sans.org slash ICS515 uh, webpage and, and keep up to date there. But yes, the intention is to make sure that the course um, goes throughout Europe, Middle East and Asia Pacific as well. Absolutely. 
And that's all the questions. So we're right on time as well. I appreciate everybody stopping in today for the webcast. Uh, hopefully you learned a little bit about what we're doing in the course. Mainly, again, the big update is on the course scenario. Um, there's new content, which is exciting, but that course scenario is going to be a ton of fun. Uh, super excited for folks. Uh, so I wish you all the best. Thank you again for joining me, and I will see you in class. All right. Thank you so much, Robert, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.